All right, one more time. We'll start this again. Uh, so let's describe the flow that I want here. When somebody fills out the form and I have no errors, I don't want to display the form again. It's like I don't want to buy my product again. I want to know that you got my form information and I need to have feedback from them. Otherwise, users are stupid, right? They're going to keep hitting ask a question and ask a question and they don't realize that I actually got the data the first time. So we want to display this form only in, in the case of when they come to the page the first time or when they submit and they have an error on my required fields. So I've got two required fields here, my name and my email address. Uh, if everything is fine, though, I want to not display the form and just say, thank you, here's all your data, I got your email, we'll get back to you soon, something like that. Some feedback to the user that they don't have to keep submitting this information. So, yes? What about the thank you, here's your data, but they look and they entered something wrong? Then they have to start over again. I mean, they've already, at this point, I've accepted everything they've gotten. I've put it in my database, I've sent emails out, I've done everything. They're going to have to write another one. That's, you can't uh, solve every problem for users. Just can't do it. I have to assume that when they say, ask my question, that they're done. They're happy with their everything. Right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, in my, uh, my view, this is my form that I'm going to display, and I want to display that only in certain cases, right? So what, what do I know about my post that lets me, what do I know about my post that lets me know they actually hit the submit button versus just coming to the page the first time? Right, so yeah, we check what parameters I have. So when I submit this, when I hit ask a question, what am I getting? I'm getting this value in the params hash. The, the key is commit and the value is ask a question. So if I have anything in the params hash with a key of commit, I know they hit the button. At least I know they submitted a form rather than just coming to the page. So that's half the equation. So I can... Uh, <laughs> In my controller, let's create a new variable called uh, submitted. And we can look in the params hash for the key value of commit, because that's the name of our form element button, right? And if anything is in there, um, I just want this to be true. If, if this is not... Uh, if this actually has a value in it, I want this to be uh, true. Not null. Not null, right? So the way Ruby works, I can say if, if this comes back, this submitted is going to be nil. If there's nothing in the commit, the submitted will be nil. So I can just say if submitted. This, this would be good enough because I don't care what's in it. I just care that it was filled in with something. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. So in my main contact form, I can put a big if statement around this. If submitted, let's do it in reverse. If not submitted, then I want to display my entire form. Come on, you've got to be kidding me. Otherwise, I have a end. Otherwise, I want to do something like uh, display thank you, right? Thanks for your information. And I've got a problem with these. These all should be indented. inside of my if, my form for, 
My form four has an end. That's the problem. My end for my form four goes here. The else then is from my if submitted, if not submitted. If it was submitted, then I'm going to get a thing. So that's half the equation so far. Let's see if that works. So if I, if I just come to the page from the beginning, I get the form. Everything is happy. If I submit the form, I get thanks for your information. All right? And it takes away the form. And this is all the, being displayed above that. So that's outside the if statement. So I'd probably move this into my if statement here. Thanks for your information. Here's what I got from you, et cetera. All right? Any questions on that so far? Okay, if, if the form is not submitted, then I'm going to display the form and any potential error messages that I have. Otherwise, I know that they came, uh, that they did hit submit, and I don't have any errors, and we're going to end up with this here. So that's half of the equation, right? I still have the problem of my two required fields, right? They're not null. I have to check that as well. Uh, so in my controller, let's check to see that my name has something in it. So I already have this. I'm setting my error message to be must enter your name. Uh, at the same time, if there's an error, I could say, uh, can I get to my languages right? Uh, I could make another variable called form error is true. And by default, I'm going to set my form error to be false. And it only gets to be set true if I had some error on my form. All right, so uh, for you guys, you're going to have to check two fields. I'm only checking one here. So if name is blank, I'm going to set my form error variable to be true. So I had some error. So that gives me another check inside of my view to display this. So how would I modify this now to fix the other half of this? I want to display the error and the, mess and the form again if my form error is true. OK. It would have had to have submitted, so it could be the same thing inside of here. So what's the not submitted section? Oh, if not submitted, or... There you go. Or my at form error. So form <laughs> error is a Boolean already. So if form error is true, it's either going to display this if I have a form error or they submitted it, they haven't uh, submitted it yet. Does that make sense? If either of those are true, then I'm going to display my form. Either or, either or, right? So let's go load this guy. So I come to the site first, and remember, you've got to check three different conditions here. I come to the page without doing anything. That's a, a get in the routing. So it displays the form. That means that submitted wasn't true. My error wasn't true either, because I haven't submitted yet. So I can start to enter some information. I enter some information, everything except my name. And I ask the question, now submitted is going to be true, but the error comes up. Uh, form error was also true. so. The, uh, my block is going to execute again. So it says, please enter your name. So I enter name. And now when I submit it, my error, I won't have an error. And I am submitting it. So it should not display any of that and display thanks for your information. Isn't that great? Sweet stuff. It is, but I leave that for you to do. 
I don't want to do it all for you. So in your case, you have an email and the name have to be required. No, I don't care if it's an actual email address yet. The fact that it is something in the field. All right. Now, if you use the HTML5 tag, the email tag, the browser will do that for you. Right? It does some of that, although that's not something to rely on. If I put in something that's not a valid email, it says, please enter it. So it, it captures that before any of my code is run. That's all by the browser. I don't have to do anything for that. You just call it, well, let's look at the source code. When in doubt, look at the source code. All right, so here is my table for email. All I have to do is call it uh, input and then the type equals email. That's a new thing. As, rather than type equals text, which is what we've grown up with, type equals email forces the browsers to use some validation. Now, not all the browsers do that, but uh, we have a bunch of different type input areas. Like we have a number field. So if we say type equals number, or type equals password, or type equals, there's about six or seven uh, different types of inputs. Uh, type equals URL, <laughs> zip code, they have got, so you can see that if I just try to type uh, URL, well, it's probably smart enough to realize that URL field tag, so it's expecting a URL formatted URL, you know, it looks like a web address. Um, phone field tag, it's got to look like a phone number. Uh, password does the, does the little circles. Uh, number field tag only allows numbers into it. Um, oh, that's a good one, number to human size. What that does is it takes a large number and tells you that if it's 4,396,000, it's going to come back and say it's 4.3 gigabytes. It does that kind of a conversion. <laughs> uh, number, I can't think of the others, but there's several. Uh, I don't know if there's an address. No. Um, zip. No. So there's several, those are all HTML5 new tags that are allowed. It also allows the required. Yes, right. And I can put required in here uh, using, like we did the placeholder. I could say required. Um, And let's see if that actually works. All right. So if I ask a question, it says, please fill out this field. So that's done, again, by the browser. But I can't rely on the browser being in place. I can write a program to post to your site and bypass that requirement completely. So that's. That's a, a five-second hack to get around that required statement. All right, so it's nice for the user, but it's not re not to re you cannot rely on that to be true. All right, good good questions. Any other question on this? So I think we've uh, beat our contact form to death. Uh, it handles everything we need. Now, when you turn it in, do not turn this in like this. This would be a fail. I don't want you to just print out, barf out the params hash all over my page. I want you to do stuff like this. Your name is, and your email is, and you can list out all the parameters that they've asked about only on this page, though. It should only be on this page. Thanks for your information. Your email address is this. 
We'll get back to you soon. That would be a nice way to end that. Again, do not put a params hash dump on your page. Debugging only. That has happened a lot. I'm telling you, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> Yeah, you could do, I mean, you could do an HTML thing like this uh, around the entire thing, which is, which what, hap what happens, though, when I do that? It's still in my source code, which in some cases is nice. I can go look at my source code now, and I'll see that entire thing still printed out. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, and you can always still see it. Now, I would not leave this in production code. This gives away too much information about the internals of your application, so I wouldn't do that. But all right, so that's what it should look like. Your name is. Thanks for your information. Of course, you're going to list everything else, and that's what happens. And we give away the form completely. The form is gone. They can't submit it again unless they go to my contact us page. If they go to the contact us page, it's as if they're starting over again and we've lost all their information. And that's okay. Make sure you validate this page with HTML and CSS. And how do we do that locally? We do local and uh, CSS and local HTML because these are not deployed on a public server that the uh, validator can get to. So I want to validate my local HTML. Let's see if it's actually working. Shazam, look at that. Is that beautiful? Beautifully uh, done. No errors. Two warnings. I'm, I'm OK with those. They are dealing directly with HTML5 and their new stuff. So I'm, I'm not going to worry about those. All right, any questions on the whole contact us form system and what you guys have to turn in by next Wednesday? Or is it tonight? No, tonight's uh, calendar. <laughs> the calendar, okay. So next Wednesday, this is what you're doing. I've basically gone through everything you need for that. Okay, any other questions? Okay. So... Let's play around with the new system. Now that you know how to build a form by yourself, Rails has some nice ways of doing this automatically for you, All right, which you cannot use on this first assignment. You cannot use It's called scaffolding. So scaffolding is, what is scaffolding if in a construction term? What is that used for? building, right? And it helps the workers get around the building while the building is being produced, right? So you're adding bricks to the building. You're doing that from the scaffold, and you're adding building bricks. When you're done, what do you do with the scaffold? You throw it away, right? You take it away, dismember it, and you've got this nice big building, pristine, and everything's happy, right? So the scaffolding was originally intended to be just that, a way to get a quick application up so that you can show uh, your prospective website owner, uh, your pizza shop or whatever, some quick stuff. I can quickly show how to create uh, some forms and everything, and it does this all for you. And then uh, originally they said, OK, once that's done, you should really rewrite this using different code. But the code that they write now with the scaffolding is pretty good. You'll see some religious wars online about using scaffolding or not. I think it's useful, and it gets a, uh, a website in place quickly. And you can always modify it as you go. All right? We can always change stuff around. So we're going to create a scaffold now for an entire product database system. So I can say right-click on my app and say new generator. I want to run the Rails generator. And we want to do a scaffold, not a scaffold controller, just a scaffold. 
and we want to tell it what we want. So we tell it, this gives you the idea of what we need here. I want the model name. So uh, we're going to call this product is our model name. That's going to be the uh, table name that's in the database. And then I'm going to give it a list of fields and types. Okay, so our first field in a product might be what? What do we, what, if you were going to create a database, an ID, okay, so Rails generates the ID for us automatically. So we don't have to worry about the ID. What would the next thing be? The, the name of the product, all right? So the name is the name of the column, and the type of this was, is going to be what? String, right? It's a string type. I'm going to store text in that. Then I'm going to have a description. Let's put a price first, sorry. And we want that one to be a decimal type. So that column, the data we're going to store in that column is going to be decimal, decimal information, right? The price, like $20.95, 20.95. Then we might have a description. And it's going to be bigger than a string. We're going to use a text field for that because it's going to be paragraphs, perhaps, of description. And then we might have, uh, in the back end, we might have the cost of this thing, our actual cost that we're selling it, that we're paying for it. We'll call that decimal. We might have, how many do we have on hand? And that would be a quantity. I'm going to call it QTY. And that would be an integer. All right? And what else do we need? Uh, total. A rating. <laughs> you don't want, you don't want total. A total of what? No, I disagree. You can generate that. I wouldn't something I would store. Okay, an image. I might want an image, so I'm going to call it image. And that's going to be a, uh, a what? A URL, right? Uh, we're going to use that as a string. Exactly right, Eddie. Uh, because we don't want to store the image in the database. We want the image to be stored in a directory on our site. So that this product uh, row has a, a URL in it or a path name to the actual image that I'm going to show, right? Uh, so that keeps our database a little cleaner. All right? A weight, all right, sure. We'll add a weight. Why not? And that's going to be maybe a decimal as well. <laughs> all right, so I think that's enough for now. That's a lot of data. So that's a nice little table that we have. And I hit OK. And it generates now, watch my little generator running down here. It's going to generate all kinds of files for us for everything that we need. Because it wouldn't be Rails without 17,000 files. Exactly. You've got you to have files for everything, right? So first of all, we'll talk about this migration in a minute. This, the, it first creates a model because now the model deals with the database interaction, right? So we... Remember the, the, the circle of life that we have. The browser sends a request, goes through the router, comes to the controller. The controller may or may not go out to the model to get data. And then it sends its data to the what? View. view, and the view goes back to the browser. So we need a model to interact with our table. Um, we have some tests, which we're not covering. And then it created a products controller for us and a products view for each of the CRUD things that I need. I need a way of showing all of the products in my table. I need a way of editing one of them, showing one of them, creating a new one of them. And uh, this is a partial. Why is it a partial? Why do I know that's a partial? It's got an underscore here, right? So this is a partial that deals with the form that can be used in both the edit and the new options. So when I create a new one, this form is going to be the same as if I edit, right? So why not just pull that out, make it a separate item, because the 
that it's going to be identical. I, I'm either going to fill it with data or I'm going to let the user fill it with data, but the form element itself is going to be the same. Okay, it creates helpers for us uh, and some assets, the, the uh, CSS that I need uh, for all of this. All right. In addition, it creates this file called a migration file. This migration file is stored in the DB folder under migrate, and it gives this timestamp. So notice 2013, 10, 16, 18 seconds, and these mil microseconds, I think, here. So this is a timestamp of when this file was created. And they do that because when you're creating a Rails website with multiple people, they're going to be creating these new uh, migration files all the time, and you want them to go in the right order. All right, so uh, let's look at this this file, this products. Uh, I mean, create products. Yes. Yes, Greenwich Mean Time, always. All right, so this is a class called create products. So the, the, the scaffolding program, which is written in Ruby, wrote Ruby for us, right? It generated Ruby code. This is a class that, what does this mean again? Inherits, all right, inherits all of the data and classes from the active record module and the migration class inside of that module. So there's one method called change that gets executed. And if you look at this, this is uh, similar to uh, SQL, right? I'm creating a table, and in that table, I want a, a, a type string, and this is the name of the table. And this is type decimal. This is the name of my column, price. And so I can, I can modify these if I want in here before I actually create the table. And that's why they do it in two steps. Then at the bottom, I've got this timestamps. So this is going to create automatically for me a row of the modification date and the creation date of this particular record. So I'm going to have two new columns, a modification date column and a creation date column, right, for every record every row in my products table. All right, so there are some cases where I might, I could uh, modify these and add some parameters to this. Uh, we're we're going to just leave this alone for now. Now I need to actually execute this code so that the table gets built in my database of choice. What database are we using here? SQLite 3, okay? We don't care what the actual uh, creation syntax is for SQLite 3. Uh, we let Rails figure that out for us. I, if I were perhaps using MySQL instead of SQLite 3, I, I still don't care what the back-end SQL looks like for creating a table. All I care is that this is, this is what I'm going to create. Rails takes care of creating the SQL command to create the table with all the fields and not nulls and all that stuff. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So if I if I was using a back end my, uh, Microsoft SQL Server in the back end, it would create the same syntax for that particular server automatically. Right. All right. So I need to run this program, and and to do that, they've set up a rake task. So I, I need to run I, under Tools. I run a rake task, and it's based on the database, so there's a lot of database tasks that I can execute. And I want to run the migration. That means execute this migration file, do whatever it says, create a new table, do whatever it needs to do, and, uh, and bring me up to date. All right, so I want to run to the latest migration. We can also do this on any of the databases that I have. I'm going to do it in development because that's what we're working with say, okay. <coughs> this is now going to go out and create the table called products, and it has all of the information I need inside of that table. All right, so let's go now look at the routing file to show what new things I have available to me. 
So when it created this scaffolding, it added this new line for me here. No, it didn't. It added this line up here for me, right? Uh, products using the, the method named resources. And what that does, it will create all of the seven different routes needed for CRUD for dealing with my database. So I'm going to take this guy out because I already had this one. I'm going to delete my get products. And you'll see that this will generate all of the, the uh, values that I need. So let's run the rig routes just to show you. Again, it has no bearing on anything. Routes, it just shows you what they are. All right, so if we look here, it created seven different, eight actually, eight different uh, values using that one keyword resources. It says in order to deal with a table in the back end, I need these eight different uh, values. So get slash products is going to go to the products controller and the index action. And that's a get. And that gives me a products path method like we used for our links, right? Uh, and these are other paths that I might use. So if I post to this, that creates a new product. <coughs> if I get from my product slash new, it's going to call the new method in my products controller, etc. So I've got all the way down to a destroy here. Okay, so with those eight, I can create, modify, update, and delete my various uh, product rows, you know, each product in my database. So let's go look at it and go to products, and that should be correct. And I've got a nice little listing of products. This was all created for me in the view. Remember, it created these views. This is called the index view. And it lists all the products. It goes out to the database. I've got a database table now called products. It goes out, fetches that information, and displays it on this page. And it gives me a link to go create a new product. So I say new product. And you know that the URL comes up here to product slash new. And look at that. It created a new input field for everything that I needed uh, for my product. Isn't that sweet? So I can say I've got skis here. They're 195.99. Uh, fast boards of death. And they cost us, uh, I don't know what, 99.95. I've got 10 in stock. And notice this is using a number field. That's, that way I can use these little scroll bars here. So that's a number field tag. That's a number field. An image is going to be something like in my images slash products slash skis dot JPEG. I'm going to give it a name for my file, right? That'll be just a string stored in my database, but then later on I can use that information to display it on my page. Then my weight, they, they weigh about two pounds, right? Um, does that usually do this for the fields? Uh, like if you don't have an image ready or something, what does that do? It does, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> uh, there are ways to validate this information, and it does it really nicely in Rails, really easy. All right, so it created it now without a name. Yes. So if I go back and edit this, look at that. All my data is back, pulled from the database, filled into the right fields, and I can call it skis. I forgot this one. Update my product. Now the same form now changes, and it says update because I'm editing this. And now I've got my skis all happy. So now when you go to your products page, you're going to know how much you paid for it. Yes. We'll work on that later. <laughs> Absolutely will. So here's my skis, my price, my description, my cost, my image, and my weight. And unfortunately, this is long. I have three links here on the side. Show, edit, and destroy. So if I hit show, 
It's going to call the method to show the data from which I can edit the data and go back and change anything. If, if I hit edit directly, it edits this particular product name with all the data filled in for me. Do you know how hard anybody in here had PHP? <laughs> Dear Lord, this would take you a week to build in PHP. Yep. Seriously. It's just insane. That was a bugger and a half to try and mess with. And this is already so much easier than most of the existing shopping cart systems. Oh, yeah. I know. Oh, oh my freaking single freaking freaking shagging. Shagging, shwagging, hacking, bagging. All of them. You can figure out where you have to go to do it. <laughs> and don't forget the chicken. All right, so I go back. Now I have a listing of all the products. I can create a new product. All right, let's create a new one called Boots. And they're $99.95, and they're warm, uh, fuzzy <laughs> hoof covers, right? And then they, they cost us only $39, and I've got ten, 20 in stock, and my images are going to be... Oops. Boots instead of skis. And they weigh 20 pounds. These are lead lead lined boots. All right, got a new one. I go back to the, my back. And I've got two products now in my database. My database now on my disk in my SQLite file have two products in this table called products. Isn't that sweet? And I can destroy them. Except destroy, we're going to have trouble getting to destroy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be able to see that. Wait. No. <sighs> so that's going to be a problem. Yeah, see that whole div is covering it up. So I can't do that. We'll have to fix that with some CSS or something. All right. Isn't that cool? Yes. So now we're going to go through the code. Yes, you had a question. How easy would it be to delete some of the fields to shorten it up? Like right here, I know. Okay. We'll be going through that a little at a time. You want to do that right now. Where is that view? By, by this information, how do I know what controller and action is being executed here? Products and index, index, right? So I go to my products controller. I have a new products controller. And this is all the code that was generated for us. And we'll go through this a little at a time so you understand what's going on. But the index method goes out and says, find me all of the products from the product table. That's all it does. And it sets up an instance variable called products. So what does products, what type of data is in products, do you think? An array of product objects. Each product object is an entire row of the cl of this class of products, right? It's one element in the entire table, just SQL, right? One row gives me one product and all of its attributes associated with that. So that's where the classes come in. Uh, a product object, I have an array of product objects. I can loop through that array and print them out, right? So if I go look at the index view for this, that's exactly what they're doing. They say, okay, I'm going to create a table. I know the name of all of these, so I hard-coded these guys in here. And then for every element in my products, I'm going to run in each loop. Internally, I call it a single product, right? So products plural is an array of product objects. Each object is a product. Yes? Sorry, you just bounced in my head. Can you actually throw a class in there to separate that from the other table that you're using? Yeah, the, it does it automatically. I'll show you in the model. It's a separate class for this. I could format, I could change this, I could do whatever I wanted here, right? What type of data is product now, though? 
It's an object. From what class? The products class. All right. It's a product class object, and as such, I can do producty type stuff with it, right? So I can look at the attribute name. I can look at the attribute price. And so these are running the getters and setters, right, from a class. See how this all comes around? Isn't that great? Doesn't that make sense? Sure. This is just HTML. This is a view that I have control over. So let's take away, let's take away the cost. All right. And let's take away the image for now. All right. We'll just take away those, and we'll refresh our page. And everything is fine except I didn't take away the titles right here, right? So I need to take away my titles of my cost header and my image header. Table header is what that is. <laughs> All right, so that's a little nicer. And now I should be able to destroy it. And it says, are you sure you want to destroy? This is all done with JavaScript, little JavaScript pop-up. You say yes. It destroys it, comes back and redisplays my page, and it's gone. Isn't that sweet? Again, another week just to destroy an object in PHP, I'm telling you. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, don't Isn't worry. that sweet? That is just so cool, I'm telling you. Now, we'll leave you uh, there on a highlight, and we'll go through this piece by piece to show you what's going on. Okay. Any questions?